Hello, I'm James Hurst. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. There have been more than 120 drone attacks against Russia and territory that it occupies so far this year. Now President Zelensky says the war is returning to Russia. Does that make any strategic sense? Mike will explain all and we will hear from someone who's been getting hands on with Ukraine's programme for an army of drones. I even tried myself to fly a drone in that simulator and it was super hard and there was like a stadium and you had to fly in different narrow parts and not to crush the drone. A sudden shake-up has put two new generals in charge of the world's third largest nuclear arsenal. We will assess China's atomic capability and ambitions. And Aidan Aslin, a British man who was captured in Ukraine but eventually freed from a Russian death sentence, tells us why he chose to fight there in the first place. I'd already lost friends and like been through like so much with what I'd experienced in Syria. Like you know, I think that I needed to get out of Britain and get to somewhere where the, the culture is not as uh, pointless. Sitrep with James Hurst and Professor Michael Clark. So, Mike, President Zelensky declares it's inevitable, natural and fair that war returns to Russian territory. And then, 24 hours later, a Moscow skyscraper gets hit by two drone strikes in a row. It does rather look like someone is trying to prove a point, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does. Um, and it is a bit odd. I mean, it's odd in a way because you can see there's a, a sort of strategic thinking behind this from Kiev's point of view to increase the pressure on Putin over the implications of the war to the Russian population. And it's showing, I think, that Kiev is not frightened of Russia. But of course, the, the Ukrainians never directly claim responsibility for these attacks. Um, and it is still odd to me that, I mean, the Ukrainian border is 400 miles away from Moscow. And the idea of relatively slow flying drones getting 400 miles to Moscow, if, that's, if, that, if that is obviously the target without being intercepted earlier, su still suggests to me that these drones are being launched from inside Russia, rather closer to Moscow. But somebody's doing them, as it were, in the name of Ukraine, even if the Ukrainians don't entirely know about it or are, are not completely behind it. But I have to say, I'm very worried about some of these things because it has negligible military effect. It's obviously a political act, but it strengthens Putin's narrative that this war is really about an attack on Russia from the West. It strengthens that narrative and it worries the Western backers because it, it, it sort of threatens the idea of escalation that sooner or later Western weapons will be used in attacking Russia. And that's something that the West has said must not happen and the Ukrainians have promised will not happen. But if it starts to happen, even in the grey zone, then it will destroy Western support for Ukraine. And as you say, the, militarily, it's a drop in the ocean. I mean, it's, it's it's tiny compared to the damage that's being inflicted on Ukraine yeah, by Russian yeah. drones and missiles. But but as you say, there there is a one potential logic to it in that while well, you say it strengthens Putin's narrative, there's an argument actually it, it's undermining his narrative at home that this yeah. has actually defended Russia. Yes, it shows that Russia cannot be adequately defended, even from a tin pot country like Ukraine, is the way that uh, many people interpret it. And Putin's critics, who are ultra-nationalists, of course, critics on the, the, the more extreme end of the spectrum than him, um, say that this proves that Putin is not pursuing the war properly. So in that respect, it, 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 it weakens him, and he's already been considerably weakened in the last month. But equally, they're pushing really, really hard the idea that this war on, in Ukraine is actually a the tip of a war that NATO is conducting against Russia, against the very existence of Russia. And it seems to me to be very ill-advised for the Ukrainians to strengthen that, that narrative because it strengthens Putin even more at home in that respect. But you do think the Ukrainians are somehow behind these drone strikes? Well, I'm, I'm sure they know about them. I mean, I, they're being done in their, in their name. And I, my own view is that they should stop them happening if they do know about them. It is hard to imagine that they don't. I mean, and the Ukrainians seem to, to delight in the fact that these strikes take place, whoever is launching them. Um, and I just think they're playing with fire when they do that. But equally, you know, drones are now intrinsic to this whole uh, war. And, you know, even in Bakhmut, I was looking at the Battle of Bakhmut fairly carefully over recent months. At any time of the day or night, there were at least 60 drones in the air 
around Bakhmut during that battle from both sides. So this is a drone war as much as it's a war of anything else. So I guess we've just got to accept that drones will be an intrinsic part of the strategies. Uh, we will look at the, that drone war in more detail in just a moment. But just one more thought on the strikes on Russian territory. Could this be a Ukrainian attempt to distract from what seems like slow progress in the in the counteroffensive on their own territory? Yeah, that's a good thought, uh, James. It might be because the progress is slow and it's beginning to worry them. There is evidence that there is some pessimism now in Kiev about what they can achieve in this offensive. They still haven't committed everything yet by many means. They've still got to, you know, as it were, launch the major part of their forces, but they hoped for bigger breakthroughs by now. And I think partly for for the sake of their own population, as well as world opinion, they want to show that they're vigorously pursuing the offensive by all means possible. So I think there is an element of that in it, yes. Well, as Mike mentioned, drones very much part of Ukraine's fight on home ground as well. But in war zones, drones do not have a very long life expectancy. There are some estimates saying Ukraine is getting through 10,000 of them each month. However, Kyiv has an army of drones program. It is now not only making the devices in their thousands each month, it's also training thousands of people to operate them. The Ukrainian journalist Svetlana Molonets is covering the war for The Spectator magazine, and she spoke to us from Kyiv on Tuesday. Ukraine has almost 200 companies who are already producing drones, and 40 of them have the contract with the government and producing drones directly for the defense ministry. So this number was just seven companies before the full-scale invasion. So we see how much it has grown in this just one year. And what kind of drones? Are we talking little drones, really big drones, everything in between? All kinds of drones you can imagine. We talk uh, also about reconnaissance drones, bus strike drones, about uh, surface drones that can travel on water and hit the Russian fleet, for example. At the beginning of the war, they were using these Mavic drones that wedding operators uh, are known for using them, you know. But right now they make drones with everything they needed for carrying the explosive. And when I was visiting the school where the soldiers were training to become drone operators, I saw them training with a strike drone by but dropping dummy bombs. Do you have any idea of how big an explosive these Ukrainian drones can carry? Those that I heard of, they are up to five kilograms. And uh, different manufacturers, they have like maximum weight that the drones can carry. And I heard about five kilograms. I didn't hear about anything heavier. And I also know that sometimes soldiers uh, have to improvise. And if they don't have the explosive, they make it from what they find. For example, the fuel for tanks or some components of weapons, they just put them together and make the explosive by themselves. So they also have to know how to do it because Ukraine doesn't have enough ammunition and all the stuff that they need. The recent drone strikes that we've seen in Moscow, could these be from those drones? Uh, yes, they could. Ukraine, of course, denies everything and says we, we don't know who strikes uh, Moscow. But I guess I read today the report from the New York, New York Post that some of the drones that they found were produced in Ukraine. So the evidence shows that it is Ukraine, just they don't want to, to say it. Do you have any sense of how rapidly Ukraine is making drones? How many a, a year or a month are being manufactured? We don't know because some companies are talk to produce like, like 200 drones per month. Some produce 2,000 per month. We know that uh, according to some estimates, Ukraine is losing 10,000 drones per month. Ukraine can produce drones, but a lot of components are important, mostly from China. So if they're reliant on components from China, uh, are, are they getting good supplies of those components or is that causing a problem? That's a big problem because China prefers to sell those components to Russia and Russia makes much bigger orders than Ukraine because they have more finances for doing that. And sometimes they... 
have to buy, for example, Chinese components, but sold to US. And it is easier to buy them from US or other countries than buy them directly from China. But then again, the, the price will be bigger. And as you say, you, you've been to see, uh, I mean, they call it Drone Fight Club, I think, a training program for these drones. What was that like? Oh, it is a school. You you just come there, you see the, a lot of computers and soldiers learning on simulators, how to fly a drone. And, you know, to be honest, they were there so happy and excited like kids because it's... I even tried my, myself to try to fly a drone in that simulator and it was super heavy. <laughs> I was like, what's it like? Is it hard? Is it easy? Very hard. And there was like a stadium and you had to fly around the stadium and to fly in different narrow parts and not to crush the drone and to put it down and like to drop the explosive, for example. So it's very exciting, but uh, it is in the first week they learn it just on simulators but the second week and the third week they learn it already with real drones first in some building closed building when they learn to fly them and the third week it is already on the field and there they drop the dummy bombs on the target and is it military personnel they're training or are civilians also training to operate these drones to help your armed forces in ukraine Mostly they tra train the soldiers for free, but civilians can learn how to fly too, but they have to pay 6,000 hryvnias per week. I don't know how many pounds it is, like 100, 140, something like that. But they are allowed to learn how to fly the drone, but not how to drop the explosives. We should remember, of course, that having talked about those strikes on Moscow, Ukrainians have been living with frequent and much larger strikes from drones and missiles for a year and a half now. Uh, what is life like there at the moment for you? In Ukraine, the same, because every few days Russia strikes Ukraine. And uh, the last week, mostly the target was Odessa after Russia left the grain deal and they destroyed over uh 100 tons of grain and also maybe you heard about the main cathedral that was damaged completely and people died uh the strikes on Kyiv are not so common right now i guess russia finally realized that Kyiv is well protected and everything they launch here is get shut shuts down but you're living in Kyiv at the moment how often are you hearing the air raid sirens Today it was three times, <laughs> yesterday it was twice. Today is weird because it is during the daytime, usually the air raid sirens are at night. And I would say sometimes they just, uh, in Belarus or in Russia, they just rise the aircraft and it flies near the border. So we have air raid alarm, but nothing happens. It is more a psychological weapon that people can't sleep at night. You know, when you wake up and you don't know you should run to the bomb shelter and you decide, okay, I will go to the bathroom where there are no windows and people, they are exhausted. And I think right now it is more like psychological pressure on the capital, more, more than like the military one. Svetlana, thanks for sharing your experiences with us and also telling us more about the drones. Svetlana Moronets in Kyiv. Thank you. Mike, we have heard a lot about the West's supply of weapons to Ukraine. I think it's easy to forget they are working hard to arm themselves too. I just wonder if there are any lessons for us in how they have massively ramped up this production of drones. Yeah, yes, there are. I mean, they've improvised a lot and they've used a lot of um, you know new technologies and they've used small, medium enterprises in, the, in all the ways that we in the West say we do, but we find it quite difficult to do that. And I'll tell you what else they've done, which is quite interesting. The, the, Ukrainian railways have always operated very efficiently and throughout the war so far, they've still operated efficiently. That's one of the great um, unsung victories that they've had. And the man who ran the railways is a man called uh, Alexander uh, Kamishin. And Kamishin has now been made Minister for Strategic Industries. And he has produced, he started to produce tanks again, T-80s. They're, they're now making uh, a number of their own T-80, call them T-84s. They've increased by tenfold 
the number of artillery shells they're producing. They've produced far, far more, about three or four times the number of Stugner missiles, which was a Ukrainian missile designed and built in Ukraine originally, anti-tank missiles. Remember, Ukraine had a, a very vibrant weapons production facility when it was part of the old Soviet Union, and it used to supply a lot of weapons to Russia. I mean, all of the, the missile engines were made in eastern Ukraine until the war started. So they've got a skilled workforce, and they're using that skilled workforce to use innovative techniques. But above all, they are led by a very, very capable administrator who I think has been given a bit like Lord Beaverbrook in the Second World War in Britain, has been given license to do what he needs to do. And the increase in production, both of, of heavy weapons and of new, innovative, improvised weapons, has been truly astonishing in the last 12 months. This is Zidrat. Next, a sudden shake-up at the top of China's military. Two new generals have been promoted to take charge of the country's nuclear arsenal. It's not clear what happened to the previous head and political commissar of the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force. They, though, haven't been seen in public for some time. President Xi made the appointments, along with a new foreign minister. Again, the previous incumbent has been absent from public engagements for several weeks. Well, let's bring in Maya Nowens, who is Senior Fellow for Chinese Security and Defence Policy at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Maya, thanks for joining us. Uh, these two new generals, how big a nuclear arsenal have they been put in charge of? Well, thanks for having me on the show. I think it's important to note that although there is concern about China's um, nuclear arsenal growing and modernizing, the force is still relatively small comparatively to the United States or that of Russia. Um, so by DOD statistics, um, Beijing has currently more than 400 operational nuclear warheads um, in 2022, that is, uh, the latest data that we have. Um, though the U.S. has suggested that this figure will grow to possibly 1,500 uh, operational nuclear warheads by 2035. The US and Russia have tens of more um, uh, numbers of nuclear uh, warheads. However, it's important to remember that um, due to uh, arms control restrictions, the US and Russia uh, under the new START agreement can only field more than 700 ICBMs, SLBMs, and heavy bombers and around 1,550 associated nuclear weapons due to deployment restrictions. So the China was a fraction of the nuclear arsenal of Russia and the US, but, but they're still the third biggest in the world, twice the size, say, of, of, of the British nuclear arsenal. Uh, the, the question is, why are they looking to, to, to grow it? How big are Beijing's nuclear ambitions? Well, I think Beijing has an ambition to uh, keep up with uh, the United States and with Russia, and I think it's operating from a position of insecurity at the end of the day, um, which is also a reason why China isn't going to be keen to enter into any uh, nuclear arms control negotiations anytime soon. Missile capability, both conventional and nuclear, are a key part of their deterrent strategy. Um, and they feel far outnumbered by uh, the United States in particular. And it's not just that sense of outnumbering. It's also um, from their perspective, they argue the fact that the U.S. is um, continuing to advance its missile defense systems uh, as well that China also has to compete with. Uh, Mike, China's got a, a no first use policy for nuclear weapons. So how much of a nuclear threat do we, the West, see China as posing? Well, no more of a nuclear threat than we see Russia as posing, although that might seem higher these days, not, I think, in reality, but it might seem that way. But I think we have to accept, as Mia says, that, that you know, China is on a, a road to parity by 2035, and they're not going to be interested in arms control until they reach some sort of parity in, let's say, 10 years' time. And I don't think the threat of, of nuclear weapons is any greater with 400 as opposed to 1,500, which I'm sure they will have. But they want to enter into the deterrent game as a one of the three fully nuclear armed superpowers. Um, and they will do that. So the threat is neither greater nor less than it was 10 years ago. We're playing numbers games now, which does affect the politics of it in terms of the ability to, or our, our the likelihood of getting back to a, a better nuclear arms control regime, which in recent years has just disappeared. Uh, the, Mike mentions the politics of it. I mean, the, it's it's not just about 
the numbers of weapons. It's about China's rules for using them. And the West senses their doctrine is changing. I mean, there's some indication that their doctrine might be changing if we look at the types of weapons that they're developing. Um, so increasing their survivability and the credibility of their of their nuclear forces, a key concern for them. But of course, they also have dual capable missiles. And so there's all kinds of developments within um, the PLARF or the People Liberation Army's um, uh, nuclear arsenal development and modernization program that call into question whether that first that no first use doctrine is going to hold as strong in the future. Of course, as you say, they have dual use weapons and it's, it's, it's not just nuclear weapons that are part of the PLA rocket force. It's also their conventional missiles as well. I mean, how big a strike cap- missile strike capability does China have? And again, is it looking to, to grow that? As, yes, as I said, um, nuclear missile strike capability is a key part of um, the PLA's deterrent strategy uh, writ large. So it's it's incredibly important missile capability, both nuclear, but particularly also longer range uh, and more advanced uh, conventional nuclear capabilities fall under the People's Liberation Army Rocket Forces uh, command as well. And that is uh, in terms of at least a theater contingency facing against the United States, potentially in the Indo-Pacific, a key component of their focus for modernization. Mike, w- what options, if any, does the West have for responding to you know in- increasing armament by China? Yes, I mean, it's not really a question of numbers so much, but uh, delivery systems matter. And one of the things that the Chinese and the Russians have been working on, but the Chinese seem to be quite a way ahead, though Amir would know better than me on that, is in hypersonic missiles and in missiles which are able to, as it were, circumnavigate the inner, the, the globe um, in low Earth orbit, in effect, and then drop down anywhere. Now, the United States didn't take these developments very seriously, but it's now taking them very seriously because it reduces response times. But if a, if a nuclear armed uh, missile can circle the globe three or four times or even more and then drop down on a particular territory, then the, the old uh, science of ballistic missile defense looks pretty thin. And the United States has now begun a sort of a, a big deterrent program to try to counter Chinese developments in hypersonic and related uh, nuclear powered missiles as well as nuclear carrying missiles. And that, I think, is where the, the competition is. Yeah, I mean, obviously, militaries tend to keep the, the, the technical data of their, their capabilities secret. But, but is it safe to assume that Chinese missiles can reach pretty much anywhere on the globe? Well, not quite anywhere on the globe, but conventional capabilities and conventional strike capabilities um, have uh, a longer and longer range, up to about 4,000 kilometers. If you're thinking of something like the DF-26 multi-role into your immediate range uh, ballistic missile, or indeed further than that, if you're thinking, for example, um, missiles that could be launched from um, legacy bombers, um, uh, conventional missiles, that is. So there is definitely a capability um, for them, uh, we think, uh, if these uh, missiles are Operate as the Chinese say that they can um, to reach continental United States or Eastern Europe um, uh, as far as that. Mayor, thank you so much. Mayor Nguyen's from the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Now, we've talked before on SITREP about what motivates people to become foreign fighters, to go and fight somebody else's war. One of the most high-profile British people to have fought against Russia in Ukraine now explains it in his own words. Aidan Aslin was captured by Russian forces last spring and sentenced to death. Eventually, though, he was released in a prisoner exchange. Russia had claimed he was a mercenary. In fact, he'd been enlisted in Ukraine's armed forces for three years and had just extended for another 12 months. This, though, was not his first time fighting for another country. Despite no military experience, he previously joined Kurdish forces fighting Daesh in Syria. He's been explaining why to sit rep Simon Newton. I was 21 when I first went to Syria. Wow. So I was, I was never really any good in like, school. Um, I eventually moved into um, security work and uh, care work. My main career ambition was to like join the police and try to do something for the community. I had no interest in military service or anything like that. 
And then along comes uh, 2011 when the Syrian civil war started. And then 2014 uh, when the rise of ISIS became dominant. And I remember like seeing the images and just how easy it was for them to take so much territory, especially after we recently just pulled out of Iraq. I was annoyed with like the amount of like effort that we put into that place for it to just be thrown away. And then along came the images that came from ISIS with like the atrocities in Sinjar with the Yazidis and the hostages that they executed. And a lot of that like personally molded me into like saying I could either continue to stay at home and complain about everything and it will still continue or I could at least go out there like moral principle and try to like do something when no one else is doing something. So you just said your mum and dad you said I'm going off to I mean how did that come about that you actually went how does it actually work? Um, well something like that is like extremely like difficult especially with at the time there was so many foreigners going out there to join ISIS I gradually like like made hints and like and then eventually like, I think it was a month before I was due to go out like I said I told her like I'm going to like Syria I tried to make sure she understood that I wasn't going to Syria to join ISIS uh, I want I want to go there to help the Kurds and obviously being a mother she was like completely against it but she also understood that it was my choice and she tried to talk me out of it but I was like completely adamant that like I'm going to go do this because who else is going to do it so you fly to northern Iraq, you join the YPG, you telling me the training was pretty basic, and then you next thing you know, you're <clears throat> involved in combat against ISIS. Most people, I'm sure you were too, terrified of what could potentially happen to you. Yeah, um, that, that was always in the back of my mind, especially when I first flew out there. I was like thinking, like, is this going to be the people that I'm, like, I've been speaking to, or is this going to be ISIS waiting for me? And I remember I got, I got to Syria and we went through all like basic, very basic training. Um, but luckily, because of the other Westerners that were going out, there was a lot of like ex-military people that like went out there for the same reason. And you pretty much adapt to what's going on. And the, the guys that you're with, like they, they try to teach you as much as they can to like survive. And a lot of it is basically just on the job training. So I remember I was with one guy, he was in the uh, Norwegian military and we, we bonded pretty closely and he would like teach us about like basic, like, like first aid. I remember when we first got sent to the front line, I was thinking to myself, like, am I, am I going to be, am I going to be able to do this? And I was like thinking like, will I, will I like just freeze? Cause I, I, I've read about that, but once I got there and I first got into the contact, like, like you, you pretty quickly like get used to it, like if if any of that can make sense, and you just get on with it. Like looking back at it, like after being through the Ukrainian military, I look back at myself as being like very naive, and um, thankfully nothing bad happened at that point. But like looking back on it in reflection, like I was like completely naive. And so you stayed there for. Three years? So I first went there in April 2015. I left in January 2016. I came back. I had some problems with the police, but like, there was never any charges like made against me. December 2016, I flew back out to Iraq and then went to Syria again. And I stayed there till June and then flew back to Greece and then back to Britain, where I still had like trouble with the police again. Eventually that was dropped. This is because they thought you were an extremist. Yeah. And I remember like one point I was, I had like some stuff that we found from an ISIS like fighter that was like camcorder, had some stuff on it. And I asked like, do, do you guys need this when I got to Iraq to the uh, consulate? And they were like, no, we don't need it. And then you get back and um, you, you basically just treat it as the enemy. And it wasn't until the second time I went out there, we were just west of Raqqa and the coalition came. I spoke to one of the British uh, SF guys, I, I don't know what it was, said to him, like, if I find anything like related to foreigners, can I give anything to you guys? And they sent a WhatsApp that I could just send a location so they could go pick it up. And when we went back, like it was, we just treated as the enemy. So that was like the main like reason I needed to get out of Britain because I just couldn't live under that like anxiety of like feeling like you're being watched all the time. So I, I looked at maybe emigrating to like France um, with the French Royal Legion. The contract for serving there was five years and I thought that was a bit too long. And also a lot of my friends that I met in Syria who were like ex-legionnaires, they told me to avoid it at all costs because it's pretty dog. 
So you, you come back from uh, Iraq, Syria, back to Newark, back yeah. home to your mum. You actively went out and sought out something different and you came across the Ukraine option. I, I'd, I'd, I'd been following Ukraine and I think one of the, like when, when I came back to, to Newark, um, I remember I had to like get a job again and I, I was working and I was just like, like, I can't work this, like this, like there's too many like uh, people complaining about like irrelevant things. Um, especially because like, at that point, like I'd already lost friends and like been through like so much with what I'd experienced in Syria. Like, yeah, I think that took like quite a big toll on me. And like, I was, I remember I was working in like one, one shop and I remember my manager, like on the down breaks, they'd be like gossiping about like really irrelevant stuff that doesn't affect anyone's lives. And it's just the very basic stuff. And I was like thinking to myself, like, God, like, do I really want to like live in this environment? Um, so for me, I needed to get out of Britain and get to somewhere where the, the culture and the like the environment is not as uh, pointless. I had like a friend who had been to Ukraine and like informed him a bit more about exactly what it is that's going on there and like what they're fighting for and defending against. And for me, that was like the the option to go there, take citizenship, and like in return, like give them my service to Ukraine and uh, basically start a new life there. Aidan Aslin talking to Simon Newton. You can see more of Aidan's story uh, talking about his capture and detention in Ukraine. That's on the Forces News YouTube channel. Uh, Mike, Aidan's story speaks to something we've heard from many people who served their own country, and that is that, that, that war changes you. And I can't help thinking that applies to entire civilian populations living through it. You know, I mean, if you look at uh, the number of service personnel that Britain has cycled through the forces since the end of the Cold War, it's about over 800,000 people and about 300,000 or so have served on operations. But there's a big difference as well between those who've served on operations, which for, and for most people, that's a very positive experience, as opposed to those who in operations have been on the front line, have been in a firefight, have been shelled, have been mortared or whatever. And I think Aidan was speaking very honestly there. Do you know the way, the way he spoke about coming back to civilian life and finding it very hard to adapt? I've heard very senior military personnel say that. I've heard people, you know, above two and three star level say, yeah, I found it really difficult to come back from Iraq or to come back from Afghanistan and adapt to the high street in an average shopping Saturday. You know, that happens to everybody. And what Aidan said there, I think, is absolutely resonant of something I've always said that, you know, people who are in, in firefights, people who are in war, as we would normally understand it, some people give up their lives some people give up normality because they get some terrible injury, but everybody, everybody gives up a bit of their sanity. And I think that's what Aidan was demonstrating there. Thank you, Mike. And thanks to all of our guests. That is all for now. Mike will be accompanied by Simon Newton for next Thursday's sit rep. Uh, Kate's still on holiday. Don't forget, if you're also on a different schedule for the summer holidays, you can never miss an episode of sit rep by simply subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. For now, though, from me, James Hurst, thanks for listening. Bye-bye.